Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40K Universe. I am your host, Gershwan, and today we're going to be talking about the Emperor's Palace. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. We post Warhammer 40K lore videos every single day. And if you have any suggestions, please comment down below. But with that said, let's get to 40 Facts on the Emperor's Palace. The Imperial Palace is the heart of the Imperium of Man. It is not only the seat of the Adeptus Terra and the center of Imperial power and administrative authority, but is the home to the God Emperor of Mankind. Located on Terra, it spreads across the whole of what used to be the Himalayan mountains of Old Earth, now called the Himalaysians. Long ago, when the Imperium was still very young, and the Emperor of Mankind had just successfully unified the techno-barbarian empires of Earth in what is known as the Unification Wars, the artisan masters of the many rival Masonic guilds raised the Emperor's Imperial Palace up, block by gilded block to be a statement of unity and regal. The warring tribes and creeds of Terra had been fused under one rule, and the Imperial Palace was intended to symbolize the staggering achievement. The Imperial Palace is not so much an edifice as it is a handcrafted landmass. The artisan masters built it upon Terra's greatest mountain range and transformed the monstrous peaks into their bulwarks. It towered above a world laid waste by centuries of war, and though that world was being rebuilt with wondrous cities and architectural marvels blooming in the new age of unity, nothing could match the magnificence of the Imperial Palace. The palace was described as pure beauty, a euphoric vision of gold and silver. It was said that when they had finished their task, the artisan masters of the Masonic guilds set down their tools and wept. By the time it was completed, it was the largest single man-made structure in known space. Its footing sank deep into the planet's mantle. Its towers probed the airless limits of the atmosphere. This massive structure is today an interconnected series of continent-wide fortifications comprised of cyclopean and pyramidal structures that extend for several kilometers into the sky and for several kilometers beneath the surface of Terra. The palace is said to have 4,029,854 chambers in its entirety. The Imperial Palace complex is divided into two security perimeters, which essentially function as separate urban regions, the outer and inner palaces, both of which are marked by thousands of landing pads for small craft and monstrous defensive weapon systems. Many of these defenses were designed and in place by the Primarch Rogal Dorn at the time of the Horus Heresy in the early 31st millennium and the Imperial Palace still possesses the scars of the terrible conflict that raged around it during the Battle of Terra, more than 10,000 standard years ago. The Imperial Palace is as heavily populated and just as active as any hive city of the Imperium. In fact, it probably has the highest density of population per square mile than most hive cities. Billions of Adeptus from all branches of the Adeptus Terra work in the Imperial Palace complex, overseeing the affairs of mankind. The levels and byways of the palace can take a lifetime to learn and only the Adeptus Custodis know them all. From the rails of the high balconies are artificial ravines 500 stories deep, filled with lights and teeming with people. Some of the great domes in the precincts are so vast they contain their own miniature weather systems. Microclimate clouds drift under painted vaults. Rain in these areas is seen as a good omen. The outer palace has become a grim slum, inhabited by millions of destitute people who have no employment beyond the few scraps they can squeeze from the tables of the more fortunate adepts. While the Adeptus Custodis is responsible for the overall security of the Imperial Palace and directly polices the affairs of the Inner Palace, security within the urban zone of the Outer Palace is normally provided by the Adeptus Arbitus. The Arbitrators are particularly concerned with providing security outside the many Imperial Government office buildings of the Outer Palace where thousands of people queue up every day to seek employment in the Adeptus Administratum, even if only as menial serfs. Such employment is better than the desperate fight for survival that confronts so many of the men and women who make their homes in the squabbled back alleys of the Outer Palace. Arbitus shock troopers are always on hand to brutally suppress the inevitable queue riots that break out every day as the grim lines of the desperate poor jockey for position. Regardless of the turmoil, the Emperor's Palace on Terra is the largest and most impregnable defense structure in the Imperium. Its inhabitants can rest assured that no outside threat will endanger them. 
The Imperial Palace was a surpassing wonder of engineering during the Great Crusade, yet the necessity to fortify the beautiful structure against the baleful intentions of the War Master and the subsequent widespread devastation suffered at the hands of the traitor hordes created irrevocable changes that made this place one of the safest in the Imperium. The ten millennia since have seen it become ever more bloated, polluted, and immense. The palace's former aesthetic lies buried beneath the strata of gothic ornamentation and the brutal grandeur of the cult imperialis. What once was bright and magnificent is now vast and lowering, a hunched architectural monstrosity that wears its martial might like a challenge to the terrors of the dark void. There can be no clearer metaphor for the fate of the wider imperium. But though the palace is a grotesque mockery of its former self, still the custodes guard it well. This is no small task. The circumference of the palace's outermost wall is measured in thousands of Terran miles. Its corridors, chambers, vaults, and plazas are so multitudinous that no single record remains to list them all. In the social subnations, clan holdings, and techno-urban surf tribes that dwell within its walls could populate entire star systems. Despite this, the Adeptus Custodes have always proven equal to the duty of overseeing the palace's defense. It is they who patrol the colossal and seemingly endless walls, who stand guard over the sanctums and armories, who patrol the petitioner's highways, the famed spaceports, and the vast fortifications. They inspect the endless miles of orbital guns and defense silos, and maintain a wary guard over the hidden vaults deep within the palace, which contain secrets so dreadful that they could bring about the fall of humanity were they ever released. And yet the Adeptus Custodes find the manpower and dedication to do so much more. For thousands of Terran years, their shield hosts have mustered in secret and set out aboard warships to strike down threats identified by the roaming eye of the Emperor. Bands of custodians have regularly patrolled the soul system, serving as rotating garrisons for military facilities based around Luna, Venus, Pluto, and numerous deep space star fortresses. The Adeptus Custodes have also long liaisoned with the Imperial Fist Space Marine Chapter, who still maintains their role as joint guardians of the Soul System, and whose immense star fort, known as the Phalanx, has often held a protective orbit over the throne world. The outer palace of the Imperial Palace is a colossal structure, the circumference of which is measured in thousands of Terran miles, so populated that the majority of it has become a grim slum inhabited by millions of destitute people. Terran-born civilians, pilgrims, and high-born nobles inhabit the towering spires of its macrohabs and spaceports that break through the atmosphere and rise into the void like the spines of some bioluminescent beast. Its corridors, chambers, vaults, and plazas are so multitudinous that no single record remains to list them all. The societal subnations, clan holdings, and techno-urbanic surf tribes that dwell within its walls could populate entire star systems. The entire structure is guarded by enormous walls and gates, the most famous of which is the Lion's Gate. The Lion's Gate overlooked the fields of the Brahmaputra Plateau, serving as one of the two massive spaceports that serviced the Imperial Palace. It had once been a thing of magnificence, a massive gate topped with two gilded beasts rising up to lock claws in feral dispute. During the fortification of the Imperial Palace in the early 31st millennia, after the outbreak of the Horus Heresy, Rogaldorn had these two great beasts replaced with macro gun ports. A curtain wall of bleak rock creek encircled the gate, its edge circled with void shield veins, like the spines of some prehistoric reptile. During the Battle of Terra, the Lion's Gate spaceport was the site of a massive battle between the White Scars and the overwhelming hordes of the Traitor Legions. The Primarch Jagatai Khan spearheaded a daring night attack comprised of White Scars, surviving remnants of the 1st Tank Division, and elements of the surviving Imperial Army regiments against the surprise traitors. Throwing a defensive perimeter around the spaceport, he held it against all counterattacks, having the flow of traitor legionnaires and materials towards the Imperial Palace at a stroke. This key victory would later prove to be a pivotal moment in the Imperial Defense of Terra. Another one of the enormous gates of the Outer Palace, the Annapurna Gate, is of the structures of the Imperial Palace that throughout the Age of the Imperium, millions of pilgrims have flocked to Terra simply to see its exquisite craftsmanship. The work encrusting this gate took Menso of Travert 30 standard years to complete, 
It was said that his ornamentation surpassed even the Eternity Gate in pure aesthetic. During the fortification of the Imperial Palace, Rogaldorn had this gate carefully dismantled with great care and stored within the palace's vaults. He intended to have it rebuilt following an Imperial victory over the upstart Warmaster Horus and his cohorts of traitors. It is unknown whether these stored elements of the gate survived the massive orbital bombardment during the Battle of Terra, or whether they are still kept within the confines of some great sealed chamber within the bowels of the Imperial Palace. Within the confines of the Outer Palace are the legendary Inner Gardens. In this garden are erected very high walks supported by stone pillars. The Inner Gardens are paradise and were constantly replenished with all sorts of flora and fauna drawn from across Terra and the human settled galaxy. The inner garden sloped like a hillside, and several parts of the structure rose from one another, tier upon tier, the appearance of the whole resembling that of a theater. Unfortunately, during the Battle of Terra, the battle raged across the grounds of the inner garden, turning the vast parkland into a charnel house. It is unknown whether or not the beautiful edifice was rebuilt completely following the end of the Horus Heresy. The Investiary was a massive amphitheater open to the night sky. Its broad space once contained the statues of all 20 Primarchs on plinths in a silent ring. The Investiary was 2 kilometers in diameter. Under the light of the glittering stars, it felt like an arena where 20 warriors had gathered to face combat. During the time of the Great Crusade, the 2nd and 11th plinths had been vacant for a long time. No one ever spoke of these absent brothers of the lost 2nd and 11th Space Marine Legion. First Captain Sigismund of the Imperial Fist Legion later urged his father, Rogel Dorn, to remove the effigies of the traitorous Primarchs who betrayed the Emperor from the Investiaries. During that time, they were temporarily shrouded. Following the end of the Horus Heresy, the effigies of the traitor Primarchs were removed as well. Also in the Outer Palace, the Hall of Lang was a favorite place for the Emperor when he was still walking amongst men. When he was not sequestered in secret toils in the deep, private crypts of the palace on his Imperial Webboy project, he was known to spend a great deal of time in the hall, measuring the angles of space and time. He was said that the past and future co-mingled at the site, and had done so since primordial time, before the place had owed the name Lang, before the Emperor had ever been born, before the roof had raised above it, or human eyes had seen it. The Hall of Lang, long beamed and dark, was simply a domestication of one of the Materium's maraud physical anomalies filled with a tangible darkness that made many people feel uncomfortable within its confines. The immense hall was starlight dark and silent as midnight. It was decorated with columns, ancient statuaries, and metallic binding apparatuses set up by antiquarians of previous years that had never been removed. Also found in the outer palace, the Hall of Victories, was a several hundred meter long hallway it was full of stasis glass cabinets, varying in size from those small enough to fit a human palm, to some the size of battle tanks arranged in rows across the hall. The Hall of Victories did not contain objects such as weapons or armor. Instead, it contained objects from across the galaxy that were millennia old that symbolized humanity's achievements throughout history. The Hall of Victories was built several kilometers under the surface of the Imperial Palace and had to be reached by elevator. The entrance of the Hall of Victories was a massive set of double doors, each gilded and engraved, showing pictures of a man and a woman facing each other. On the left door, the woman held a babe in the crook of one arm and a sword in her hand, her hair flowing like a waterfall, mingling with a billowing dress that in turn merged with the long grass of her feet. On the right, the man, dressed in worker's overalls, chained with a cross lightning bolt of unification hanging around his neck, had a wrench in one hand and a pistol in the other, looking to the skies. Between them burned a stylized star, surrounded by other pinpricks in the sky. Above the doors, ornate scroll work held a caption written in an ancient Terran language that, when translated, stated people of Earth together. Once the doors were swung open, arched windows to the right let in sunlight that illuminated the hall. The stasis glass cabinets in the Hall of Victories held objects like the navigational circuits from the first warp-capable ship and a broken piece of human-made clay pottery that was broken into eight shards marked with fingerprints and dents that dated back tens of millennia. Most of the objects held in the hall were technological or scientific in nature, but some were cultural. 
In the outer palace can also be found the Sanctum of the Thousand Eyes. It is the stronghold of the Adeptus Custodis specialist formation, known as the Dread Host, which rises to dominate an entire district of the Imperial Palace. This armored bastion is lit with electro braziers and arc looms of immense size, all angled to underlight the 500 enormous eagle statues that line the Sanctum's upper battlement. Each as large as a super heavy tank, these ominous sculptures are posed in vigilant stances, many staring up into the stellar gulf while the remainder peer down upon the thralling processionals below. Superstition runs rife that the eagles of the Sanctum of a Thousand Eyes can perceive disloyalty no matter where it lies, and that the Emperor looks through these avian eyes to see the darkness in men's hearts. To some extent this is true. Each eagle contains a complex array of long-range augurs, servitor cognitator banks, and multispectral listening devices that feed floods of information down into the Sanctum's data shrines. This information is used by the Dread Host to isolate and annihilate threats to the Golden Throne. The last and probably largest structure within the Outer Palace is the City of Sight. This was the main headquarters of the Adeptus Astra Telepathica during the Great Crusade and the opening days of the Horus Heresy. During those bygone days, the City of Sight appeared as if there was no trace that anyone lived in this forsaken part of the palace. Potential sanctioned psychers spent many years within these bleak towers, learning how to harness their abilities for the betterment of mankind. Where other regions of the palace were celebrations of the unity brought by the extension of the Emperor's rule over all of Terra, the builders of the City of Sight seem to have gone out of their way to craft something calculated to weigh on the soul. Beyond the domain of the astrotelepaths, the architecture of the palace was raised up in glorification of mankind's achievements its statuary fashion to remind the grateful populace of Terra of all that had been rebuilt in the wake of the terrible, world-spanning wars that had almost dragged human species down into extinction. But none of this could be found in the City of Side. At the heart of the City of Side lies the Conduit, the nexus of all intergalactic communication for the Imperium of Man. Originally carved out of limestone by an army of servitors, these high roof chambers are filled with black-clad infokites plunged into their cognitators and arranged in hundreds of serried ranks. Once a telepathic message is received by these infokites and interpreted and sifted by the Cryptiasians, it is passed on by the conduit to the recipient via newel tubes. The inner palace of the Imperial Palace is the very heart of humanity. It is where countless bureaucratic adepts labor anonymously to keep the galaxy-spanning empire of mankind running smoothly in the name of the God Emperor. It contains the headquarters of the most important imperial institutions, such as the Astronomicon, the Senatorum Imperialis, and at its very heart, the Sanctum Imperialis, the throne room of the Emperor of Mankind himself. Without a doubt, the most important and protected location is the Sanctum Imperialis. Located in a subterranean chamber, it is also referred to as the Imperial Dungeon. This great hall holds the huge, baroque cybernetic life support system that maintains the life functions of the nearly comatose body of the Emperor, the Golden Throne. Below the Golden Throne, in serried ranks of unbroken valor, stand the 300, the elite of the Adeptus Custodis, the Emperor's bodyguards, called the Companions. They stand eternal vigil over the Master of Mankind, while the rest of their fellow superhuman warriors stand guard throughout the continent-spanning complex of the Imperial Palace. Although billions of people work in the palace complex. Very few have ever had the honor of stepping within the holy chambers of the Hall of the Golden Throne. Hordes of tech priests from the Adeptus Mechanicus scurry about the Sanctum Imperialis, performing the maraud tasks that they do not understand, but are required to keep the Golden Throne's ancient mechanisms functioning. In a large arena constructed in front of the Golden Throne, the psychers brought by the Imperium's infamous black ships from across the galaxy are so bound to the Emperor, so that they may enter the service of his Imperium as sanctioned psychers. The entrance to the Sanctum Imperialis is protected by the Eternity Gate. The Eternity Gate is the final gateway into the symbolic heart of the realm of man, the most sacred place of humanity in the whole of the galaxy. Thousands of banners line the mile-long grand hallway that leads to the Eternity Gate. These are the ancient and tattered banners of the greatest and most valiant armies to have fought for mankind. Illustrious heroes such as Dorne the Unwavering, Lord Solar Macarus, Malkador the Hero, 
the list goes on, as well as famous Imperial Guard regiments and banners of the various Space Marine chapters. Just as these loyal servants have honored the Emperor with their valor and sacrifice, he returns such honor. At the end of this long passageway stands the massive double doors of the Eternity Gate, standing unbreakable, forged of tempered adamantium, layered with thick ceramite. The outer face of the Eternity Gate is sheathed in shimmering gold. Carved upon its surface is an ornate mosaic of the Emperor himself, at the height of his glory during the Great Crusade, with shield and sword in hand, standing triumphant over a great serpentine beast, the embodiment of evil. Two immense reaver-class titans of the Ligo Ignatum flank the great archways that lead onward, serving as columns, one blood red, one royal purple. High over the archways, carved in obsidian, a massive palatine aquila, the wide-winged double-head eagle of the Imperium. The bowed carapaces of these giant combat walkers sustained golden mosaic roofings in which were buried the heavy macro cannons and multi-launchers of the titans, just as their great armored feet were locked under the floor. Purity seals and devoted banners dangle everywhere. By each side of the archway sags a titan's gargantuan power fist, which could seize and crush to liquid any unpermitted interloper. The other jointed arm of each titan terminates in a massive, poised defense laser. Inside jutting armored heads of each titan, rotations of warrior adepts of the Collegia Titanica have posted an honor guard during the last ten millennia. For thousands of standard years, these two titans have stood as columns, immobile, statuesque, awing all who approach. Yet in the ultimate emergency, their plasma generators can power up rapidly from standby mode. The electrically motivated fiber bundles that serve these war engines as muscles could tear their heaviest weapons free from the roof, bringing tones crashing down as blockade. The god machines can then break free their feet and open up on the invaders with devastating fire. Even on standby, the titan's power fist sometimes flex and pluck a body from the floor if the devotee in the titan's vast metallic head sees it fit to demonstrate their power. Away from the Sanctum Imperialis, but still within the massive inner palace, lies the great chamber of the Senatorum Imperialis. This massive meeting chamber is where the Imperial elite hold their parliament, and is best known as the meeting place of the High Twelve. Comprised of twelve of the most powerful members of the various Adepta that are the cornerstone of the Imperium, this council makes up the High Lords of Terra. It is within this chamber that the High Lords are tasked with interpreting the Emperor's will and enacting his rule across the largest empire the galaxy has ever known. Many monuments and memorials are scattered throughout the Inner Palace. The Pillar of Bone is believed to be a monument raised on Terra to the Imperial Fist's courage in an unnamed campaign. In reality, it is actually a sacred relic to those privy to the truth within the Imperial Fists. The Pillar is the last remnant of the once great Imperial Fist Fortress Monastery on Terra. It was destroyed during the Horus Heresy in the midst of the Battle of Terra, but to most of the huddled masses of the Imperium, the Heresy is now no more than a legend, and few would dare to openly claim the forces of Chaos had ever set foot on the sacred ground of Terra. In the holes torn from the column by the bolter fire of the Traitor Legions are the scrimshawed hands of Imperial Fist Battle Brothers. Another great monument is the Column of Glory. It is a massive, crystalline pillar of multi-hued metals rising half a kilometer high, under a vaulted dome so lofty that clouds form to obscure its frescoed arcs. Studying the column are hundreds of shattered suits of power armor, belonging to Blood Angels, White Scars, and Imperial Fist Space Marines, who died defending the Imperial Palace 10,000 standard years ago during the Battle of Terra. Within these shattered suits of warplate, the bones of these valiant Astartes still hang. Their skulls stare out with rictus grins from open faceplates. The Column of Glory stands as an eternal testament to the sacrifice the Angels of Death made in defense of the Emperor of Mankind and the homeworld of humanity. This is a sacred place of pilgrimage, where crowds of young psychers, robed as acolytes, pray under the watchful gaze of their instructors. Soon these psychers are led onward to be soulbound agonized, blinded, and consecrated for service to the Emperor. Squads of helmeted Adeptus Custodes stand to attention vigilantly, armed with their guardian spears, 
The air was full of cloying, reeking incense and dissonant music, gongs and harps, which boom, twang, and ripple, matching the pulse of ancient adorned machinery. Amongst the thousands of minarets, towers, and spires that rise from the inner palace and breach Terra's ever-thinning cloud cover, one and only one of these towers stands out from its gold and marbled kindred. As it is colored jet black, it is called the Tower of Heroes. The summit of this looming structure is capped by a bell tower. The belfry itself is the size of a cathedral and houses a single bell forged of unassuming commonplace metals marked by the stains and patinas of time's eroding touch. This lone bell is the size of a titan and attended by hundreds of men, women, and servitors whose existence is entirely devoted to maintaining the sacred instrument's functions. This is the Bell of Lost Souls, a colossal iron bell that is as massive as a building and adorned with dark runes. In order to maintain peace and order, the Adeptus Custodes maintain an office of watch within the inner palace known as the Tower of Hegmon. Within the tower lies the watch room, the nerve center of security operations for the Adeptus Custodes and the Imperial Palace Complex. The central cognation consoles stream constant divergent data elements and run comparison contrast programs. The watch room's codifier assembly thralls and pans the global data sea and the unified biometric verification system, grouping together reams of desperate elements making connections and following traces. With this elaborate security system set in place, every day a billion clues and a million secrets are analyzed and examined by the Custodes watch, sifted with acute, painstaking precision through the ever-shifting fluid levels of Terra's information sphere for any internal threat to the Emperor's personal security. Every 60 minute, the watch room prioritizes a dozen of the most sensitive findings for special attention. Even though the massive outer palace protects the inner palace, should the need arise, the inner palace is well stocked and prepared for war. The House of Weapons is the ancient formidable armory of the Imperial Palace. The Adeptus Custodes and the Imperial Fist Chapter are known to store their arms and armor there. Within the arming chambers of the lower levels, servitors and penal slaves ritually plate squads of Astartes anointing them with oils and whispers as they lock each piece of armor into place. As solitary beings, the Custodes do not surround themselves with slaves, servitors, aides, and hand servants. They prefer to armor themselves, alone, pragmatically, and without ceremony. The sheer size of the inner palace makes it impossible to fully map out. Within its many chambers and spires lie many secret locations, like the shrouds. The name given to the secret chamber located deep within the confines of the inner palace that serves as the headquarters of the Officio Assassinorum. It was the primary meeting place for the various masters of all the six assassin clades and was overseen by the Grand Master of Assassins. During the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy era, this post was held by Malkador the Sigilite. Another purposefully hidden construct within the inner palace are the Dark Cells. Formerly known as the Vaults of Rython, the Dark Cells are a particularly sequestered and forbidden subdivision of the deep levels below the Imperial Palace Complex. It is here where the specialized shield host of the Adeptus Custodes, known as the Shadow Keepers, stand eternal vigilance over rune-locked portals which contain terrible things locked away for all time. Eldritch terrors from the depths of Old Night that could annihilate the Imperium, for the Dark Cells hold such horrors at bay that mankind's sanity would not survive their release. Though neither sight nor sound can escape the forbidden cells, the air of those corridors is charged with dread. A perpetual menace thickens the shadows and makes them crawl. Even the superhumans of the Adeptus Custodes are forever on edge in those dark places, for the sense of unspeakable threat never wanes. And those were 40 facts on the Emperor's Palace. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to share it with your friends on Facebook, Reddit, whatever social media you guys use. It really helps out the channel when you do so. And I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. This was Gershwan with One Mind Syndicate signing out. <laughs>